The purpose of the Center for Baptist Studies at Carson Newman University is to promote and nurture Baptist identity and heritage to, student, to students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of Carson Newman. To that end, we offer the Carlisle Marnie Lecture in the fall and the T.B. Maston Lecture in the spring. This morning, we offer the 2019 T.B. Maston Lecture. A native of Newmarket, Tennessee, Dr. Maston was born in Jefferson County on November the 26th, 1897. He graduated from Carson Newman in 1920 with a Bachelor of Arts degree and was awarded an honorary Doctor of Letters by Carson Newman in 1958. As a professor at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, for over 40 years, he influenced deeply the lives of thousands of Baptist ministers. Dr. Maston produced scores of articles and wrote 23 books in the area of Christian ethics and Christian development. True to the Baptist heritage of matching Bible-centered beliefs and Christ-honoring behavior, Maston led in the movement among Southern Baptists for racial desegregation. Writing on the subject as early as 1927, Maston published two books in 1959 urging Baptists towards integration as the proper Christian stance. Those who knew him remember that he had in his office an entire file drawer full of the hate mail that he received from those that did not appreciate his advocacy of racial integration. One of Dr. Maston's favorite scriptures was 1 John 2.6. He who ab says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Until his death in Fort Worth on May 2nd, 1988, T.B. Maston always challenged himself and others in the Baptist tradition to live out an authentically Christ-like ethic. In the lectures named for him and sponsored by the Center for Baptist Studies and the T.B. Maston Foundation, Carson Newman University celebrates the life of Dr. T.B. Maston, genuine human being, authentic Baptist, and devoted follower of Jesus Christ. This morning, we welcome Dr. Kimlin Bender as the 2019 T.B. Maston Lecturer. Dr. Bender is Professor of Christian Theology at Baylor University's George W. Truett Theological Seminary. His primary area of research is in 19th and 20th century theology, with a particular specialty in the theology of Karl Barth. Through his though his publications extend to include work in ethics and philosophy, in addition to his historical and systematic theology. Dr. Bender has published three books in the field, Reading Karl Barth for the Church, A Guide and Companion, Confessing Christ for Church and World, Studies in Modern Theology, and Karl Barth's Christological Ecclesiology. He is also the co-editor of Theology as Conversation, The Significance of Dialogue in Historical and Contemporary Theology. His work has been published in numerous journals and collections, including the Scottish Journal of Theology, International Journal of Systematic Theology, Theology Today, Christian Scholars Review, Soundings, Sophia, Perspectives in Religious Studies, and the Journal of Religion and Society. He's a recipient of numerous awards, including the David Allen Hubbard Award from Fuller Theological Seminary, the Outstanding Faculty Award from the University of Sioux Falls, and he received the Elie Wiesel Prize in Ethics. That was a first prize. That's for undergraduates, and it's something that you can compete for right now. I do want you to know that while he was earning his PhD at Princeton Theological Seminary, he earned his doctoral degree in systematic theology under Dan Migliori, a name that will be familiar to many of you. As an ordained Baptist minister raised on the prairie of North Dakota, he's preached in many churches and has served ministries in the Dakotas, California, and New Jersey, and most recently as the senior pastor of Oak Hills Baptist Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a church that grew under his leadership while he was teaching full-time at the University of Sioux Falls. He and his wife, Trudy, have three children. Please join me today in welcoming the 2019 TV Maston Lecture, Dr. Kimlin Bender. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction and thank you so much for having me here. It's a wonderful privilege for me to be here at Carson Newman today and to join with you as I talk about um, um, a lecture that I think will be uh, address something that we all deal with today. The, the letter, lecture's title is Christian Discipleship in the Digital Age character formation and the cha challenges of cyberculture. I want to thank uh, the administration and faculty, the selection committee. I especially want to thank uh, the religion faculty who, has host who have hosted me this, these few days and it's been such a wonderful thing and I especially want to thank Dr. Andrew Smith for all that he has done to, to, to make my visit here possible. So thank you and thank you for coming today. I'm going to begin um, this lecture uh, recognizing also T.B. Maston, as has been said, as an ethicist, and I've tried to follow um, the spirit of ethics as I've uh, addressed this lecture and the intention of the lecture. The subject I am going to address today is Christian faithfulness in the digital age. That is the primary question to be addressed, though another way to get at the theme is to see it as addressing the broad topic 
of Christian ethics and technology. In taking this question under the larger theme of ethics, and as I hold ethics necessarily situated as a subfield of Christian theology, I seek to both address the particular moral questions raised in our online world and respect the intentions of the endowment of this lecture to honor the legacy of T.B. Maston. Hearing reference made to ethics and technology might lead you to draw a number of early conclusions about what I'm going to say. So I want to clarify at the outset what I will and will I what I will not be addressing. First, I will not talk about particular cases regarding technology or specifically about the internet and social media. I do think those discussions are important, but I want to attend to the broader meaning of ethics in the earliest sense, which for the ancient Greeks as for the early Christians was not centered upon solving moral problems or determining what to do in particularly sticky situations. And you, you know what I mean when I mention such quandaries, often used to teach ethics in freshman college classes. There are three people in a boat, but the food is scarce and quickly running out and can sustain perhaps only two of you with sharks all around the boat. And should, you, should they, should you, A, share all the food and all of you die, or B, throw one of the persons overboard to the sharks so that two of you can live, or C, acknowledge that if you are in a boat with two strangers in shark-infested waters, you made some pretty bad life choices and you probably deserve to become an ethics textbook illustration. <laughs> Things like that. No, I would like to focus not on sticky technological situations, but upon the original meaning of ethics, which was not so much about making decisions, but about being a certain type of person, about moral character rather than ethical case studies. The early Christians thought about this question of character differently than the ancient Greeks, despite some similarities. For the Greeks, ethics was tied up with our actions, which led to habits. And our habits, in turn, became ingrained in us as virtues, our good qualities and skills, or, when bad, our vices, our bad qualities and skills. A number of early Christians were influenced by this way of thinking, but there were always differences between Greek and Christian conceptions, not least because Christians believed in grace and that our character could be changed by an encounter with God whereas the Greeks, and Aristotle specifically, thought we were simply the sum total of our habits and in a sense captive to them and thus self-determined. Now a number of Christians, and particularly Martin Luther, did not like this way of thinking about good actions, habits, and virtues at all, and for some significant reasons. Some in Luther's day saw our relationship with God as dependent upon the development of such virtues, though, and this is important, always as assisted by grace. Luther believed, however, that this way of thinking was to get things backwards. God does not forgive us because we are good or holy. Rather, we are called to love God and our neighbor and to live holy lives because God first loved and forgave us. Nevertheless, once this order is firmly in place, we're still left with the question of how we are to live in the present as people who have experienced God's mercy and forgiveness. In other words, we rightly ask as to the shape of Christian freedom that has been granted to us, as well as to the form Christian discipleship is to take. Long before Luther, the Apostle Paul stated that Christians are to be people who demonstrate the activity of the Spirit in their lives and who live in such a way that reflects such activity. Paul instructed the Christians in Philippi to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, just as he continued, it is God who works in you. Furthermore, Paul himself specified actions and qualities that were contrary to the Spirit of Christ and that Christians were to avoid, such as quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, factions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. That list sounds pretty much like a number of online discussion board comments, doesn't it? Paul also commended actions and qualities that should mark the life of the Christian such as the fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And while these things are the fruit of the Spirit and not our own doing, Paul can immediately go on to speak not only of divine agency, but of our own, exhorting his readers to keep in step with the Spirit by which they live, and then adding the direct command, let us not become conceited, provoking one another. Lists like those just mentioned can be found in other Pauline books as well, such as Ephesians, where readers are told, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building others up. They are then instructed to get rid of all malice, bitterness, and anger, brawling and slander, to, along with every form of bitterness, and to replace these with kindness and compassion. Not to make light of this, but these are New Testament naughty and nice lists of actions and attributes. That is, lists that set forth actions to be avoided and actions to be done. There are also lists of qualities of character that are to be condemned and rooted out, and lists of those qualities that are to be encouraged and nurtured. Indeed, New Testament scholarship calls such lists virtue and vice lists, and they are found throughout the New Testament. It is generally recognized that they borrow from earlier lists in Judaism and perhaps even from some former Greek ones, though they are now transformed into lists that are distinctively Christian in content, shape, and meaning. Paul, like the other writers of the New Testament, was concerned with questions of Christian character and how we are to live in light of the gospel. And he told the Philippians that they are to contemplate, to reflect, to meditate, to think upon about and, ab and upon anything that is true and noble and right and pure and lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. By reasonable extension to today, it is upon such things that we are to set our minds and where we are to spend our time and to focus our attention and our concentration. In light of the New Testament, we can legitimately ask, what kind of life am I? What kind of life am I and are we as God's people to live? And today I want to deal with the following questions. How can we live a life of faithfulness in a digital world? And what aspects of that world can provide particular difficulties and temptations that stand in the way of becoming the kind of people we should be? And how can a life of faithfulness be fostered as we live a wired life? I think these questions are of great importance for any Christian, though I also think that any thoughtful person who is interested in the question of who they want themselves to be will find it of importance whether they're Christian or not. As we begin to think of these things, a few other qualifications are in order. First, what I'm going to share is not a lecture condemning modern technology. For me to do that would not only be wrong, but hypocritical. I type this presentation using a word processor on a computer, quite happy for the cut and paste ability it provides. I made use of Google and other online tools during its composition, and I love the ability to track things down and corral them now that my mind is slowing down perhaps a bit with age. Moreover, all the temptations I will speak about today are things that I believe that you and I share in common. So I have no interest in bashing technology or the internet in general, though I do think the online world does present not only benefits with some distinct challenges, but also some dangers in our lives. The second qualification is that I'm not going to be talking about any specific content on the internet. Most of the time when people talk about the dangers of the internet, they talk about the content one can find there. Certainly there is much online that is degrading to human life and character, and you know what I'm talking about. So while the content that can be found on the internet is an important topic, it is not the focus here. I want rather to address the form of the technology itself, not the content it delivers, but rather how it delivers it and how we are shaped by utilizing it. It was Marshall McLuhan who recognized that while new technology debates begin with questions about a medium's content, what really matters is the impact of the medium itself. For every new medium not only carries content, but changes who we are. I remember in one of my early years of teaching, reading through a new translation of Homer's Iliad that had been done by Robert Fagels. Fagels wrote an extended introduction to that book, and I was fascinated by his discussion of how the Iliad came into existence. In brief, mem people memorized the entire thing and recited it across generations. Now let that sink in for a moment. Have you ever read the Iliad? Have you ever read part of it? It is extremely long. And it was entirely passed on from one generation to another to another through memorization. How can you do such a thing? Well, the mind can do amazing things, and perhaps things that we can't even conceive of today when it had to. The primary answer is that uh, this memorization went on, and it stopped being done, and we can ask, why was it stopped? 
And the primary answer is that such memorization passed away with the appearance of writing in print. There's no need to memorize such a poem if you can write it down and read it when you want to remember it. When stored on paper surface rather than in the mind, it can be shared with others in a form that's relatively easy to access. Moreover, this written form is much more reliable than human memory, however excellent. Here's another way to think about this. Consider the telephone game, where one person whispers something into the ear of another, who then whispers it into the next person's ear around a circle, until the last person says what he or she has heard. That game would be a lot less interesting if it consisted of one person writing down something, and everyone passed the note around the circle, and the last person read it. Not very interesting as a game, but a remarkable kind of technology nonetheless. Pen and paper now able to record exactly what was thought and to preserve this thought around the circle and therefore through time. So here we discover the first rule of any technological advance. Something great is gained. In the case of writing in print, what is gained is the ability to produce, record, share, and preserve vast amounts of information. But something is also lost. In the movement from oral to print culture, the mental discipline and achievement of vast and meticulous memorization. In other words, with the ability to commit things to writing, much information moved from internal to external memory. Later, after the invention of movable type to produce books efficiently and economically, nearly everyone could have, an, have access to a Bible, for instance. But fewer now, perhaps, hid God's word in their heart, in the language of Psalm 119. That is to say, after everyone could own a Bible, fewer people memorized scripture. Let's fast forward to the present. We are now in the middle of a technological revolution perhaps as significant, and some argue more so, than the revolution that took us from an oral culture of memorization to a literary culture of the printed word. In regard to learning and education, entertainment and social life, we are moving from the realm of print to the realm of a digital online world where much of human interaction is not face to face, nor even the reading of books to others, of others, but of engaging others in a virtual world. This is the digital revolution, and it may have effects that are as far reaching as that of the prior invention of reading and print. And if the rules of technology hold true here as well, and I think they will, with every such movement there are benefits and there are costs. The benefits of the technological revolution are many, and I don't think anyone has so winsomely described them in recent years as Clive Thompson, whose book, Smarter Than You Think, How Technology is Changing Our Minds for the Better, is a wonderful examination of just how deep and far-reaching the technological revolution of the internet is for us today. Thompson describes a world in which we are able to preserve vast amounts, unbelievable amounts of information for posterity. Furthermore, Today, more people have access to the collected knowledge of the world than ever before, much of it no more than a few keystrokes away. So while there are both benefits and costs to the digital age, Thompson is on the whole optimistic about its benefits. We are living in a time in which the collective memory and intelligence of persons can be harnessed to solve problems in new and exciting ways. One example, there was a problem that biologists could not solve, they were working on for a decade. It was the unfolding of a particular virus that causes AIDS in monkeys. They sent that out and crowdsourced the problem. They had worked on it for a decade. 200,000 people worked on it. They solved it in three weeks. Having found, uh, which is, is really a remarkable thing to think about. Besides access to a wealth of information and the ability to increasingly conduct more refined searches of it, we are also in a world in which we can learn a tactile skill, not simply by reading directions, but watching someone perform this for us on YouTube, or where a child can learn mathematics by reviewing a lecture over and over on Khan Academy. These are all great benefits. But there are also certain costs. Now before considering these questions, we must first admit that debates over techno technological revolutions are in fact very old. As Thompson notes, each new tool of, tech, of communication has provoked panic that society will devolve into silly chatter. For instance, in contemplating the telegraph, Henry David Thoreau was decidedly pessimistic about the technological changes in his lifetime. He wrote, we are in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas, but Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate, as if the main object were to talk fast and not to talk sensibly. We are eager to tunnel under the Atlantic and bring the old world, that is Europe, some weeks nearer to the new, that is to our world in America. 
but perchance the first news that will leak through into the broad flapping American ear will be that Princess Adelaide has the whooping cough. If Thoreau had said that of the telegraph, I cannot imagine what he would say about texting today or about the internet and people's concern about the fashion sense of Kate Middleton, the Duchess of Cambridge, which by the way, you can check out at whatkatewore.com. And don't worry, now Meghan Mar Marple has her own page, whatmeganwarp.com. If Thoreau worried about the telegraph, Mark Twain worried about the telephone, mocking it in his short work, A Telephonic Conversation. And such worry continued with the arrival of every new technology. Lee DeForest, the father of radio, looked back toward the end of his life in 1952 and spoke of the moral depravity of commercial broadcast media and of the moronic quality of the majority of today's radio programs. At the very least, such consideration of the past allows us to keep from making romantic allusions to a time when everyone read and thought deeply and spoke insightfully and avoided the trivial and the vulgar. There was no such time. But debates like these over technology started much earlier even than Twain and Thoreau. In Plato's work, The Phaedrus, Socrates is horrified by those who have moved on from memorization to print, in effect exporting their memory from their minds to written records. Socrates did not think that storing this knowledge in print was really knowledge at all if it was not held in the mind through memorization. And he insisted that no wisdom can come in this way, for the written word is but a pale reflection of the living voice of a living person. Yet almost no one today would say that only those who had memorized large swaths of information were learned. We long ago moved from memorization to print, from an oral to a literary culture, and this led to a realization that learning can be gauged by one's ability to retrieve and synthesize material contained in books, and that this is a much larger swath of material than could ever be contained in one mind, regardless of its powers of memorization. Yet perhaps what becomes most apparent when we read Thompson and others is not that revolutions in technology always provide great gains amid true losses, but that technology cannot simply be blamed for changing us, though it does. Rather, technology is the means by which the weaknesses of our nature are revealed on a larger screen. Marshall McLuhan stated that a medium is anything that stretches, extends, or amplifies some human capacity. So we should not be surprised that technology extends not only the good, but also the bad. Technology is the amplification of character into an ever-expanding public world. So leaving aside for the moment the question of whether technology is making us worse as thinkers, as persons, as moral agents, even as faithful Christians, what is at first striking is that technology reveals the problems we have always had, but it casts them on a bigger canvas. The Apostle Paul exhorted his readers to think of others and not only of themselves. And he did not have to experience social media to understand the weight of the problem of our own selfishness, self-interest, and even narcissism. Nor did the problem of apathy arise only after the invention of the Xbox or the iPhone. Caring about caring has always been a challenge, as all parents of teenagers from the beginning of time have known. And caring about our character and the life we are called to live has always been an uphill battle against our fallen nature and can only be waged in light of the Spirit's own work hence the vice and virtue lists in the New Testament. Rather than causing the problems of narcissism, apathy, selfishness, sexual anarchy, and general nastiness, social media and the internet simply provide a much bigger screen on which such narcissism, indifference, self-obsession, prejudices, mean-spiritedness, lust, and general nastiness can be projected. The ugly and brutal language that appears on common boards below articles is certainly something that the an anonymity of the internet fosters. Of course it does. But it is too simple to say that it creates such thoughts. The bad tree bears bad fruit. And while most persons would not speak as they do on, comments board, on comment boards or on social media where they speaking to a person face to face, technology doesn't create the ugliness of the speech, but simply reveals the reality of the hidden convictions that give rise to it though it does without question make their appearance more readily evident and, at, and rampant. In other words, technology is perhaps as appropriately understood as that which reveals character as that which shapes it. And so the back and forth comments and discussion threads on the internet are not unlike and indeed reflect the life we find in the philosopher Thomas Hobbes' description of the state of nature that long preceded the digital world. They are often, to borrow from Hobbes, nasty, brutish, 
and short. Well, not always short. In this regard, technology is seen to be that which reveals rather than creates our character. But the matter cannot be left there, for there are, in fact, even more substantive dangers about the digital revolution than its ability to amplify and extend human vice to a larger and larger audience. For if Clive Thompson is the digital world, world's defender, Nicholas Carr is its prophetic antagonist. In his Pulitzer-nominated book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, as well as in subsequent works, Carr, like McLuhan and Neil Postman before him, reminds us that the medium of information is not simply a neutral viaduct of conduct, but it shapes our thinking and our conduct as well. Since the appearance of Carr's book, many others have followed with similar claims of how technology not only amplifies character, but also reshapes it and the mind itself, and thus changes us in very deep ways. Carr decries the fact that the deep reflective thought we need to read a challenging book, the kind needed to quietly ponder over a problem, the kind needed to meditate upon the large questions of life, existence, and action now seems to elude him, his brain itself changed by so much flitting around the internet. Like a hummingbird that whirls from flower to flower, simpy, sipping only superficially from each but drinking deeply from none, the, in, the internet is designed to move us from distraction to distraction, from the trivial to the trivial, all for the sake of exposing us to more and more advertising. Carr has thus made the art famous that Google has ruined our brains. Carr is, however, no grouchy old man who despises technology. He fully recognizes the great gains the internet provides, including all of the advantages for research information sharing mentioned earlier. But if Thompson celebrates these benefits, Carr calls us to recognize the costs. As he writes, the advantages are real, but they come at a price. What the net seems to be doing is chipping away at my capacity for concentration and contemplation. Carr reminds us that technology that pertains to our intellectual life not only expands our cognitive abilities, but it changes them. And just as the appearance of maps allowed us to think of space in abstract ways, and the invention of clocks allowed us to think abstractly about the passing of time, so the digital world has changed the very way we think and reflect at all. And for Christians and for all thoughtful persons, this should cause us some concern. It is one thing to become mathematically lazy in an age of calculators, or to stop bothering memorizing phone numbers when our phones dial them for us. But while there are such ways that memory can be outsourced, this doesn't work with our character. We can commit our memories to a hard drive, and with a new kind of memory, retrieve them. And this may, in the end, not lessen our cognitive abilities or our learning and our intelligence. But outsourcing does not work with character. We can outsource our data collection, but we cannot outsource our critical thinking and theological and moral reasoning. And one of the great dangers of technology is that it can lead us mistakenly to particular forms of self-deception, all requiring critical theological analysis. First, the power of modern technology can lead us to think that access to information is the same as knowledge, and to confuse the wealth of data on ethical subjects with wisdom itself. Moreover, our increasing abandonment of print culture, the world of books, for that of superficial internet browsing, is robbing us of an ability to think in the reflective, deep, and linear ways that are necessary not only for a rich intellectual life, but for any critical theological and moral reasoning, and for spiritual formation that is enduring and of transformative value. Let me make this point concretely. Today, the Bible is not only a book that can be owned by nearly everyone, but it can be immediately accessible to us digitally. Yet while it is nonetheless true that having the entire Bible on our smartphones might be cool, it says nothing at all of our knowledge of the Bible, much less of our understanding of it as Holy Scripture, and nothing at all of our wisdom in discerning how we are to live in light of its central message. Indeed, one could make a case that never in the history of the world has the Bible been so readily accessible and have aids to its study been so numerous and yet knowledge and understanding of the Bible are today strikingly thin and sparse, not only in culture, but in the churches themselves. And when the content of our theological and moral reflection is so attenuated, because our knowledge of scripture is so thin, then no amount of technology will be able to work with what just isn't there. In other words, the fact that I have the Bible on my cell phone and always available to me wherever I go 
may in fact not help but hinder my reflection upon it and my internalization of it, for it may blind me to the fact that access to information is not the same thing as the appropriation of knowledge and is certainly not the same thing as the achievement of understanding and the acquisition of wisdom. Indeed, the fact that the Bible is always close to me on my cell phone may lead me into the great lie that I do not need to hide God's word in my heart because I always have it in my pocket. This delusion that access to information equals real understanding may lead us to think that we can outsource all our memory and reflection to technology, but this too is mistaken. You can't reflect on what's not there in your mind to begin with, nor can you do a Google search for something you have no idea of what you're looking for. In short, you can't solve a problem of the intellect without knowing enough to understand why it's a problem in the first place. And this background knowledge is only gained through prior study, focus, and concentration. By extension, we cannot act creatively to address spiritual, theological, and moral issues in our times and in our churches without having spent careful time gleaning the knowledge, experience, and wisdom that make such creativity possible. This great temptation, the temptation to confuse access to information with the possession of wisdom is the delusion of omniscience. This is an ancient delusion with the internet now taking the place of the tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden. At its worst, it is a rejection of our finitude that refuses to acknowledge the limitations of our knowledge and our dependence upon God for our wisdom. And this is a great temptation and it is complemented by other great temptations that the digital age uniquely bring to us. Another of these is to confuse connectivity between persons with true relationships. And yet another is to confuse the awareness of social problems with actions for their resolution. The confusion of online interaction with real embodied relationships and of global awareness with real local action is the delusion of omnipresence. At its worst, it succumbs to a Gnosticism that believes our existence can be translated into a disembodied digital presence that confuses online friends for real formation that occurs in embodied friendships. As we are not omniscient, so we are also not omnipresent or omnipotent. While the internet and digital media certainly can and may increase our knowledge of the world and its problems, as well as extend our presence and action, it can also deceive us into thinking that we can know and do all and that being online is akin to being everywhere. But as the ancient writer Seneca noted, to be everywhere is in the end to be nowhere. While all three of these temptations are powerful, the digital age seems particularly susceptible to the first, that of omniscience. Though technology is amazing at helping us glean facts and access information and connect with others, its power decreases exponentially as we move from facts to knowledge, from knowledge to understanding, and from understanding to wisdom and the formation of our character. If this is true, then the digital arena must be framed and offset by a rich exploration of the mystery of the gospel, as well as a retrieval of those older practices of prayer, meditation upon scripture, deep reading in the wisdom of the ages, focused intellectual and moral reflection, and the disciplines of spiritual formation. It is this disciplined attention and concentration and the ability to read deeply which are perhaps especially placed in jeopardy in the digital age. And here the particular challenges and costs of the digital ecology appear most acute. For if the church of the past was concerned about where we put our money and where we put our time, Today we might rightly ask if the digital economy is robbing us of our attention and our concentration, indeed the unity of our very selves. That our attention is being stolen by the invasion of ever-present and intrusive technology, as well as by the perfection of distraction and of the inflaming of our passions and desires for commercial purposes, has been recently and persuasively argued by Matthew Crawford and others such as Tristan Harris self-described as Google's eth design ethicist, who has written that technology does nothing less than hijack people's minds. In plain English, your attention span is up for sale, as is your privacy, as you probably know in the last few weeks. And the more things to which you pay attention online, the more of your attention that can be sold to advertisers. I think in the research of, that I've done, the thing that's most shocking to me is that all the great large companies, social media companies, the most important people that work there are social psychologists. They work on, on things that, th the same thing that makes you go into a gambling casino and keep pumping quarters into a machine is the very same thing that keeps you pumping and touching the apps on your phone. It, there's a reward system. 
And they know this, and they manip manipulate us all tremendously, and, and everyone's aware of this now. Um, if you want a great job today and want to make an awful lot of money, go into social psychology and into psychology generally and learn how to manipulate people through intermittent uh, reinforcement. That the digital age has heightened our possibilities for distractions and that quiet reflection is on the wane, these things are, I think, indisputable facts. And Carr documents these extensively. Yet all the more reason that Christians must here act against the grain of our digital culture. For it is indisputable that much of the internet's flood of information is trivial, cheap, and silly, and that its penchant to shape the mind for distraction is powerful. Unless we want simply to subsume our life into the vapid, the trivial, and the ephemeral, we must find time for those ancient practices of prayer, for meditation, reflection upon the sources that give our, con our convictions and our character. Scripture singularly, but also wisdom of the ages, wisdom that's been captured primarily in the literary age. The Bible itself is the product of this age, and in fact played no small part in the development of this literary culture. Indeed, the Codex, the early forerunner of the book, as the forerunner of uh, uh, the early forerunner of the book, is in no small part a Christian invention. It is the accumulated wisdom of the past that stands as a witness against our current fascination, indeed idolization, of the immediate, the new, and the present. That we live in the digital age does not mean that we renounce it entirely. Digital technology, with its power to enhance connections, both informational and relational, has its gifts to contribute to us. But Christian faithfulness does require an intentional commitment to foster in ourselves the disciplines that limit its problematic effects. This entails placing limits upon the trivial while cultivating the significant, all the while staving off its addictive tendencies. As Thompson himself says, if you want to internalize a piece of knowledge, you've got to linger over it. You can't flit back and forth. You have to focus for a reasonable amount of time with mental peace. But today's digital environment rarely leaves any such peace. Think of all the bells and whistles and beeps and dings every time you get an email, a text message, or a new update of any kind. How can any sustained thought be done in such a world, one in which the average American checks their phone numerous times every hour and more than 50 times a day? As Thompson states, constantly switching between tasks is ruinous for our attention and focus. It certainly does not prove itself beneficial for meditating on scripture or for reflecting upon difficult societal problems. Indeed, as Crawford has stated, what seems to be at stake as our mental lives become more fragmented is nothing less than the question of whether one can maintain a coherent self. Christian discipleship is a life lived in conformity to Christ, of attendance to his gospel, and of reflection upon the witness of its message in Holy Scripture. This attendance and reflection is, first and foremost, an intentional and intermittent withdrawal from the digital distractions of our lives, just as we must withdraw from any kinds of distractions. Discipleship requires the time and quietness needed to reflect and bring some unity to the fragmentation of our own interior life, to know who we are and what we are about, and more importantly, to obey the divine command to be still and to know that I am God, to hear the divine promise that thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Facing this interior life, facing it squarely, and even facing it down, is at the heart of being honest with ourselves about who we are and what we are to be. For facing up to ourselves is the first step of courage. The online world does nothing to foster such reflection and does much to help us avoid it. Indeed, it's designed to undermine it. When I was in college, there was a woman who cut my hair. She told me she had the radio and the television on all the time at home. I was maybe about 20 years old. I asked her why she did that. She said, because I cannot stand to be alone with myself. The internet did not create this problem of self-avoidance, but simply stands in a long line of technology that provides a way for it to occur. Yet is perhaps the medium most given to reinforce the trivial and make this avoidance possible. It is certainly the medium most suited to make our temptations readily available at any time and at any place while simultaneously stoking our addictive behavior through what psychologists call intermittent reinforcement, which I spoke about. 
It does all of this while insulating us from ever seriously considering the challenges that call our temptations and addictions, not to mention our prejudices, our presuppositions, our convictions into question. The church has always recognized the need for fasting in order to sharpen the mind and to gain control over bodily desires. Perhaps the new forms of discipline that would, would not simply be to abstain from food and from sex, as the early church taught, but to find times to abstain from the call of the immediate, the urgent, the insatiable, and the readily digitally available. In other words, to find times away from the digital world in the wilderness of the offline one. Food is not bad, but desires for food necessarily need to be curbed for proper health and happiness. The same holds true for sex. C.S. Lewis noted, it does not take a prudish, prudish person to know that while sex is a gift to us, we can't act on every sexual urge without the destruction of our lives. And as Lewis added, our appetites grow by our indulgence of them. What the digital age reveals is that what has ever been true of food and sex is also true of information for intellectual desires can mirror bodily ones. Christian discipleship is thus a matter of rededicating our churches and ourselves to the formation which Paul reminded his listeners can only come about through the Spirit's work, even while we ourselves are called to our own correspondent creaturely obedience. A mind that does not stand still long enough to study scripture is one that will not be able to stand still long enough to listen to a sermon or even to this lecture. A restless mind, formed by endless distraction, will find it difficult to reflect upon the deep mysteries of faith, the depths of our own depravity and moral failure, the height of divine grace, the breadth of the human experience, and our own calling as Christian disciples. In brief, if we do not rein in our digital temptations and addictions and really pray for this, we are in danger of an impoverished shallowness. The irony is that our lives will not be interesting enough to tweet about if we are not interested enough in things more substantial than Twitter. The obvious lesson in the end is that our online lives require the same necessary discipline as our offline ones. Even Thompson, with no apparent religious intent, reflects on religious practices as a way to do this. Digital practices are therefore understood soberly and done in moderation because we rec realize that there are even greater ends for which we were made. The need for regular and dedicated times of meditation, for reflection upon thoughtful reading, for intentional face-to-face -face friendships and conversations with others are part of gaining the qualities of empathy, of patience, of persistence, and of pathos or suffering. They're also necessary to appreciate the fact that we are finite persons who possess finite knowledge, presence, and, active, and energy, and that the illusions of omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence that technology gives us are based on a very old lie about our ability to comprehend all knowledge and affect all things and in turn deny our finitude as creatures. Such should lead us to remember our mortality, which in turn should lead to a stance of true intellectual as well as moral humility. It may also help you as college students to accept the vocation into which God calls you. As Walker Percy said, lucky is the man or woman who does not secretly believe that every possibility is open to him. For while there are many things technology can do for us, and these are rightly celebrated, there are very important things it cannot. And shaping our character as reflective and faithful Christian disciples can be benefit from, but not be accomplished by the tools we use. The tools themselves can, if we are not careful, delude us into thinking that our great access to information and awareness of the problems of our world are the same as the wisdom and character we need to live and act well within it. The church and Christians within it must ever remember that God has chosen to reveal himself to the world not through a screen, but through a son. And this without question has ever unfolding implications for how we relate to God, to others, and to our world. Thank you.